We're starting a new series called Live Hero. And I mean, what do you think of when you hear the word hero? Think about that. Uh, perhaps it's uh, a favorite movie star <laughs> or an athlete or uh, maybe a, a fantasy figure like Spider-Man, Superman, or one of the Avengers. Uh, here's an interesting fact I found about heroes. They have something in common. They appear safe, undefeatable, and eternal. You know, a hero could also be somebody that you esteem, that you look up to, that's invested in your life. They're heroes. And, and, and those characteristics, are, they're attracting. They capture our attention. Uh, they help give us focus, help us get the goals accomplished that we've set in our life. And so today, I start a series called Live Hero, and I want to share with you different biblical heroes that uh, we see in the Old Testament. But we're going to look at that through the lens of the New Testament. So I'd like you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews 11, you have a kind of a litany of characters of old from the Old Testament. It's known as Faith's Hall of Fame. We're going to look at those different individuals over the next couple of weeks. And the 11th chapter is a continuation of the 10th chapter of Hebrews. And the writer of Hebrews wrote to the Hebrew uh, Christians. And he wrote for a specific reason to encourage them. They were going through a rough time. These were Jewish individuals who got saved. And because of their walk with Jesus Christ, um, stepping away from Judaism and the, the rituals and the rites and the ceremonies to a relationship with Jesus Christ, they were being persecuted. They were going through a difficult time. And so the writer of Hebrews is writing this letter to encourage them in their faith, to stand strong in their faith. And he does so in a beautiful way. In fact, he finishes up the, the chapter 10 with a phrase noting, the just shall live by faith. That's verse 38 of chapter 10. The just shall live by faith. Faith is what all believers, followers of Jesus Christ, ought to have. Wouldn't you agree with that? And that phrase, the just shall live by faith, it's found a number of times in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews, I just read it to you, 10.38. And the writer of Hebrews is giving illustrations of Old Testament heroes to show just how to live by faith and, and the results of, of su such living. And here's the thing that I like about these heroes of the faith that we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. And they're heroes. God uses them in amazing ways. But I think the thing I like best about them is they're flawed. They're flawed individuals. You know, I can relate to that. They're not perfect. Uh, they, they run into problems. They don't always make the best decisions, but God uses them, and we can learn from those times that God uses them. We can learn the characteristics that they had and just the obedience that they uh, showed, and we can be blessed by that and learn from that. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, the first four verses, starting with verse 1. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's, by the way, the definition of faith right there in verse 1. For by it, people of old received their commendation. Verse 3, by faith we understood or understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. I want to stop there and just make a, a point. The universe was created created by the Word of God. God created everything. Somebody asked, well, when, where did God come from or who created God? That's the wrong question. God has always been. He's God. And, and God created everything from nothing. Think about that in light of what you're going through right now. Going through issues, trials, struggles, whatever it is you're going through. Let me rephrase that. Whatever you're going through where you need a miracle, you need God's intervention, do you think that the God who created everything from nothing can work in your life and do a miracle? 
I believe he can. I believe he can. The just shall live by faith. So God created everything by his word so that what is seen, and I'm in verse 3, was not made out of things that are visible. And here we go, verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. You might say, well, he's dead. How does he speak? He's speaking right now through the word of God to us, to encourage us. There's some things that I'm going to share with you that you might find interesting and maybe you never heard before. Abel is in this litany in the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, this, this list of heroes, Abel, the fourth person of the human race who was created, Abel. Do you know who Abel's parents were? Adam and Eve. Abel had a brother named Cain. And we see something that is just remarkable. A number of things I want to share with you right now that I believe will not only build your faith, but help you grasp this statement that I'm going to make in a moment. I titled the series Live Hero, and I did that for a purpose, and the purpose is this. If you are a believer of Jesus Christ, you're a hero. You're a hero, and, and this is why. You're part of kingdom work. If you're a follower of Christ, you notice I didn't say Christian. Because a lot of people say they're Christian. I'm talking about individuals who are followers of Jesus Christ. You're, you're a Christian if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And hence, you are part of this process of sharing the good news. In other words, whether you scatter seed, the gospel seed, or you're the one that waters it, or you're the person that sits and holds the hand of the individual and prays and leads them to Christ, wherever you're at in the process. Maybe you're the individual, you just let the light of Jesus Christ shine through you and how you live and how you speak, the body language that you communicate. People can see Jesus all over you. Wherever you're at in that process, right, you're part of kingdom work. And because of that, you're a hero. And the reason I say you're a hero, and I believe that with all my heart, and you may not look at yourself like a hero, but listen, we have the answers as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. The world is upside down. People don't have purpose. They don't have hope. We have purpose and hope through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is the only way we can get centered with God through Christ. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life. And so we're heroes in the sense that we can help draw people, steer people, direct people, love on people to come to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To have eternal life for the clutches and grip of Satan to, to let go because they come to faith in Christ. You're a hero. You're a hero. And Abel's a hero. And we can learn from him. There's some things that he did that, that benefit our faith and build our faith. Abel, number one, acted through divine revelation. This is really important, and it requires that you pay attention in particular to this one point, because it may not make sense if you drift off and think about what you're going to have for lunch today, okay? So listen, <laughs> Abel acted through divine revelation. It says that, that by faith, Abel offered. Abel and his brother Cain gave an offering to God. They gave an offering. And the term by faith, Abel, by faith Abel offered, that term by faith or through faith, uh, you've heard it, you've probably said it, but not everybody understands that term in a biblical sense. By faith means divine re revelation. True, true faith's foundation is divine revelation. Here's what Romans 10, 17 says. It says, so then faith comes by hearing, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So today, too many people claim that, well, it's, 
I, I'm being moved by faith. I'm believing in faith that this is going to happen. I had a dream, a vision. Someone said, thus saith the Lord, or they prophesied, and they, they spoke uh, this faith into existence in this direction, this purpose that I'm going to move in. And, and, and I would say many times that's not faith, that's flesh. And I'll tell you why. If the foundation of that direction, that word, that prophecy is not founded in Scripture, in fact, many times those things are contrary to Scripture. It depends on who says them and what is being said, but the content, if it's not in alignment with Scripture, it's not by faith. It's by flesh. In other words, you could say, I have faith that this is going to happen. I have faith. I have faith. I'm going to go down this path. God spoke to my heart. And by the way, it happens to be a path, and I won't be specific, but it's a path that clearly is in violation of Scripture. It would cause you to live a life of sin, that path. But you say, you state, or you hear someone state, it's by faith that I'm doing this. God's led me. I feel comfortable about it. If it's contrary to God's Word, it's not by faith, it's by by flesh. And that's important that you catch that because you may say the Lord's leading you. Uh, you may have made plans and regardless of the circumstances, you, you feel like, well, I just feel that, you know, I feel right about this. And I want to tell you, don't put too much stake in feelings. Feelings. <laughs> Nothing more than feelings. They'll get you in a lot of trouble. Feelings will. Led by your heart. Just do what your heart tells you. No, 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 no. Do what the Lord tells you. Yeah? If I did what my heart told me, I'd, I don't know. It'd be pretty bad, you know? <laughs> do what the, the Lord tells you in the direction the Lord gives you. And He speaks to us through His Word. He spoke the universe into existence by His Word. So His Word's powerful. Be careful what you read. Be careful what you watch. Test it with Scripture. And here's the thing. Many times we'll see somebody we'll, uh, teaching a Bible study, preaching a message, and it sounds good. It's like, praise God, amen, amen, man. That, they're passionate. This is exciting. God's moving. And then all of a sudden they say something, and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. The red flag goes up. Have you ever had that? It's like, that doesn't sound quite right. Hopefully that doesn't take place here. But, uh, but that doesn't sound quite right. The red flag goes up. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, guiding you. Putting that red flag up, that's one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. He illuminates. He brings light to things. And so someone might be preaching or you might be reading something that's supposed to, supposedly a Christian book, and you read it, and it's like, oh, this sounds so good. Whoops, what? And then what you do is you go through your word, the Bible. It's like, that's not what it says here. It's contrary to the word of God. That's how the enemy works a lot of times. Very rarely is he blatant. He's very subtle, and he mixes things in, and there's truth here and truth here, and then he inserts that lie, right? So you have to be careful how you're influenced. Abel, by faith, it says, by faith, indicates that he had divine revelation. Well, what am I trying to say? Well, I believe that either God spoke to Abel to direct him, and I, I call that divine revelation or a divine order from God. God spoke to Abel to indicate what kind of offering would be acceptable and obedient, that something that God would accept. Possibly, God may even spoke to Abel through his parents, Adam and Eve. But he had that divine revelation or those divine orders. And here's another thing that we can learn about Abel. Abel's offering was an act of worship. An act of worship. Worship is the highest function of the human life. God created us to worship Him. That's why I love coming to church and worshiping the Lord. And sometimes I feel like raising my hands. Sometimes I feel like shouting. Sometimes I just feel like just basking in that experience of worship. It's very personal. And yet it's corporate, and that's the beauty of it. I love to worship. God's created us to worship. True, true Bible faith, true biblical faith leads a person to worship God regularly. 
regularly and correctly. And Abel's offering was an act of worship, and it was correct. It was good. In fact, he gave of his best. Abel's offering to God. This is why he's a hero. This is why he's listed in Hebrews 11. His gift was the best. Look at Genesis 4.4. We have the story. Abel also brought a gift. He brought it to God. The best. Abel brought the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. He brought God the best. I mean, there's been times I've pulled up to the church and there's hefty trash bags. Somebody's cleaned out their garage or their library, and there's just a bunch of stuff they want to donate to the church. And it's used items. Sometimes it's even broken. And I'm waiting for the day to pull up, and there's a brand new car that somebody's donated. Or even better yet, a brand new Harley. I would love. But listen, you know, Abel brought the best. I'm just messing with you. Not really. Abel brought the best, and, and, and the price of his faith was high. Look, he went out into his flock, and he got the lamb that was without spot or blemish. It was the perfect lamb, and that's what he brought to God. He brought that to God. In fact, it's no accident that offerings in, in the Bible many times are called sacrifices. Our, our, our giving is in the category of sacrifice. When we give, it's in the category of sacrifice. And, and you may tithe regularly, listen to this, or you may tithe religiously, but if there's no sacrifice in, in that, hear me out on this, you're not giving what you ought. I know I'm touching on a t touchy subject, but the principle of giving in the Scripture is not tied to the tithe. It's tied to the sacrifice. It's got to be sacrificial. Faith operates on the principle of the Scriptures. Abel offers unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You see, faith does things with excellence. We should never have the attitude that Hey, this is, this is church, this is ministry, we're doing this event, this event or that event, and that's good enough. Let's just, let's wing it. Uh, we don't need to spend all this time pre preparing. Let's just wing it and let's just get it done. And No, 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 no. God demands excellence. We should give excellence unto the Lord. If, if you're signed up for something, show up early. If you're a part of ministry, you give your best. Your best, not your second best, but you give your best. Abel gave his best. He gave his best. Cain didn't. I get my gas at Sam's Club. Because it's cheaper. So I spend about $5 in gas to drive down to Sam's Club to save about two fifty dollars on gas. Just makes sense. I don't know. Just feels good. But anyway, I put the Sam's Club card in, and then it asks for the debit card, right? I fill the tank up. But before I do that, there's always decisions in life to be made. And I look at the tank, and it says unleaded, usually 87% octane, or premium. Of course, I drive a truck, so I put unleaded, the cheap gas. And, but I had that choice, and, and that's what faith is. Faith is a premium it's in the premium category. It does things the best. And, and both Abel and Cain, they both made an offering to God at the same time. But our, our text says that Abel's offering was a premium. It was better than Cain's offering. Cain's offering was not based on divine revelation. It, it says he's a tiller of the land. And he just gave something that he had grown. But Abel went out and he got the best of his flock, the lamb, without spot or blemish, and, and he brought it in. And, and listen, for us to live as heroes, it requires that we do everything to the best of our ability, even if we're at a job we don't like. You do things at a premium. 
because you're doing them unto the Lord in everything that we do. You're a husband, a wife, a worker, a student. You do it unto the Lord. If you're flaking off and slacking, shame on you. You do everything 100% unto the Lord. That's how believers of Jesus do things. Amen? That's how we do things. I wrote, heroes of God, I have it on the screen, give their best. They give their best. Abel gave his best. He did not save the best of the flock for himself, but he gave the best of the flock to God in this offering. He gave the best. Look what Malachi in chapter 1, verse 13 says. Boy, this is hardcore stuff. Malachi says, and when you say I'm bored and this doesn't do anything for me, you act so superior, sticking your noses up in the air, act superior to me, God of the angel armies, God says. And when you do offer something to me, it's a hand-me-down or a broken or useless thing. Do you think I'm going to accept it? This is God speaking to you. Wow. So Abel gave his best. Cain's offering, it says it was described as, uh, it's described as the fruit of the ground. He was a tiller of the ground, a farmer. He, he, as I said, he evidently brought something that he had grown, but it wasn't as good as Abel's offering. And, and there's really nothing in the description in Genesis that, in the text in Genesis, that refers to Ains, uh, Cain's offering as being excellent or the finest or the best, but Abel's was an excellent offering. Here's here's the third thing you you and I can learn from Abel. Abel's offering foreshadowed the greatest offering of all. It foreshadowed the greatest offering of all. Abel's offering was a lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God. Abel's offering was a perfect lamb. Jesus is perfectly holy. Abel sacrificed the best of his flock. There was the shedding of blood. The scriptures say without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It, it's a forward look. That's, we use the word foreshadowing. It's a forward look at what Jesus did. Here's the amazing thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is found in Genesis in the story of Abel's offering. He gave a perfect lamb, offered it to God, sacrificed it. The blood was shed. In 1 John 1, 7, it says, The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So that slaying of the lamb represents that. It's a foreshadowing of what Christ did. Revelation 13.8 says, slain from the foundation of the world in reference to Jesus. John 1.29 says, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood on the cross. And the only way we can have forgiveness is by way of Jesus Christ. Cain's offering wasn't a foreshadowing of Christ. It had nothing to do with a lamb, had nothing to do with the shedding of blood, no cross. Cain's offering was far inferior to Abel's offering. And and so Abel's offering was an offering of faith, a premium, the best offering. And that's an example for us to live at that level in everything that we do. And finally, I want to close with this. Abel was commended as righteous. You know, so many people spend their lifetime trying to accomplish great things and become famous and do different things, but few have the goal of living a righteous life. In fact, the Scriptures say that's quite difficult. Romans 3.23 says, everyone has, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. So why attempt or try to live a righteous life when we're sinners? We were born into sin. We struggle with sin. Well, our righteousness is founded in Christ. The only way that we can be righteous is when we step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we have his righteousness. That's what the scriptures tell us that. Look at our memory verse that I've chosen this morning. 
It's Romans 3.22. Not too long ago, someone asked me a question. If you could only have one book of the Bible, and the Bible consists of 66 books. If you could only have one book, Steve, which book would you pick? And I said, well, Romans. I, I would pick Romans because Romans has it all. It really does. The book of Romans has it all. And Romans 3.22 says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning you're feeling disconnected from God. And I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've been suffering through. But maybe you feel disconnected from God. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Look what it says. And this is true for everyone, for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, God loves you, desires a relationship with you. And he has to offer a, a wonderful gift. It's our blessed hope, gift of eternal life, forgiveness of sins, no regrets, no shame, no condemnation, a life of liberty, freedom. Doesn't matter what anybody has said. Doesn't matter what you've done. You get up underneath the loving arms of the Lord Jesus Christ and receive his forgiveness and inherit eternal life. You're not really living until you do.